Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Callan Steinman. I'm Curator of Education here at the Georgia Museum of Art. And I'm very pleased to welcome you all to today's program, a curator and collector chat um, uh, with Dr. Kieran and Dr. Rose Brady. Today's program will focus on a discussion of Ukrainian social realist paintings from the Yuri Manichuk and Rose Brady collection. A selection from this collection is currently on view at the Georgia Museum of Art now through September 26, 2021. So I'll briefly introduce our speakers today. Um, Dr. Asin Kieran is the Parker Curator of Russian Art here at the Georgia Museum of Art. And he's also a professor of art history at the Lamar Dodd School of Art at UGA. Um, Dr. Rose Brady is a writer and editor based in Naples, Florida. She worked for many years as a senior editor and senior writer for Business Week magazine, which is now Bloomberg Business Week, and was Business, Business Week's Moscow bureau chief from 1989 to 1993, where she covered the end of the Cold War and of the Soviet Union. Rose Brady has a PhD in political science from St. Petersburg State University in Russia and an MSc in international relations from the London School of Economics and Political Science and a BA in English from Yale University. She was married to Yuri Manichuk in 2000 and inherited his art collection after his death in 2009. She is the author of Capitalism, uh, uh, Russia's, Russia's Struggle to Free Its Economy, which was published by Yale University Press in 1999. Joining us today as well, a little bit later in our discussion is George Nesterchuk, who heads Nesterchuk and Associates, a management consultant firm in the Washington area. Um, he has held executive leadership positions in both the private sector and government and has served as a senior official in three prior administrations. Um, Mr. Nesterchuk was a friend and colleague of Yuri Manichuk and looked after the collection for many years after its arrival in the United States in 1998. Uh, Mr. Nesterchuk shared uh, uh, Yuri's interest in art, and over the years, he too acquired a collection of contemporary art of Ukrainian and Ukrainian American artists. Mr. Nesterchuk holds an MS degree in um, astronomy and physics from the University of Maryland and a BA in physics from Cornell University. So a really wonderful group of speakers today. Um, today's program will begin with an overview of the collection and a conversation with Rose, including some commentary from George. Then we will have time for questions for our speakers. So at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A box and a chat box. Please put any questions for um, our panelists in the Q&A box, and, and we'll get to those when we have time for Q&A. So you're welcome to add those um, um, throughout the conversation, and we'll moderate those in the Q&A period. And if you have any questions or concerns regarding technical logistics or need help troubleshooting anything with Zoom, please leave those in the chat and I'll be logged on throughout the program to assist with any technical concerns. Um, and, then, and then following the, our Q&A period, Dr. Kieran will use the remaining time in our program today to discuss, um, to discuss uh, socialist realism as an artistic style and genre. So without further ado, I'll turn things over to Dr. Kieran to begin our program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, thank you for making this event uh, possible. Um, at the start of our conversation today, I would like to express my uh, most profound gratitude to our donor, to our donor, uh, Rose Brady, uh, who bestowed on us this wonderful gift, which is the topic of, of today's discussion. Um, in addition, I would like to acknowledge the contribution of Edward Kasinek, uh, the curator emeritus of the Slavic and Baltic division of the New York Public Library, who uh, participated in the process of, of, of negotiating this gift. And, and uh, last but not least, uh, I would like to express my uh, gratitude to the director of the Georgia Museum um, who supported this initiative. So thank you to Dr. William Underwood Island. Um, it is uh, somewhat unexpected to find a collection of socialist realist paintings um, in the Georgia Museum of Art. Um, and uh, this uh, uh, makes the collection uh, even, I hope, more intriguing. Uh, but what I see as, as very relevant in this uh, wonderful new addition to the permanent collection of the Georgia Museum of Art is that it takes place at a time when uh, dozens of nations across Eastern and Central Europe 
These are the people who were once a part of the Eastern Bloc who lived under communism. They at present are beginning to rethink and reinterpret the art of the communist era created in their own countries. So uh, at present, all around Central and Eastern Europe, there are major, major developments that basically will lead to writing a new version of the history of art um, during the 20th century, because the art of the communist era now is viewed not simply as a historic document of, of brutal political dictatorship, but a worthy phenomenon of, of human creativity. And I hope that the, the paintings we are going to discuss today will serve as an example of this and we'll, we'll be able to convince our audience that that is indeed the case. So the paintings uh, that came to us, there are six paintings. They were collected in Ukraine um, after the independent Republic of Ukraine uh, was established um, uh, following the disintegration of the Soviet Union. Um, these were works of art that uh, uh, were not highly appreciated at the time of this political turmoil. We are going to learn more about the specific motivations and the specific goals that Mr. Yuri Manichuk pursued uh, when collecting these uh, works. What I would like to do uh, first is to give you a sense what the paintings are and to tell you a little bit about them. So this is a portrait of Mr. Manichuk um, uh, with some of his paintings. Uh, a portrait created uh, during the period of time when he lived in the independent, newly established independent uh, Republic of Ukraine um, in 90, the painting dates to 1996. So the, the, the portrait is not uh, among the paintings gifted to us, um, but the, the, uh, the work that you see on the screen is one of the six paintings uh, forming this gift. It's a word of a wonderful self-portrait of a Soviet artist, Zinida Volhovinska, which is uh, very large. It's almost life-size. Life Two large pieces of cardboard um, rendered. The portrait is rendered in pastel. This is the only painting that we are not displaying currently because of the fragility of the, of the materials used for its creation. The painting needs conservation um, and we're still working on it. But as you can see, the painting dates to 1953. This is basically uh, the year uh, of the death of Stalin, the end of one of the worst periods in the political history of the Soviet Union. And we have this wonderful creative young lady who created a portrait of herself in front of, of, of another portrait of a lady rendered in a distinctly modernist avant-garde style. So there is a story there. We can talk about it later. Um, the five paintings uh, that are on display are large, oil on canvas works um, and they occupy the walls of the large longitudinal gallery of the new permanent collection wing. So here you see two of them um, and then uh, the other three paintings are grouped um, together. The first of these paintings um, shows a subject typical for socialist realism art. It shows the leader of the world proletariat, Lenin, his wife, Nadezhda Krupskaya, who herself was a major communist functionary. But the environment in which we see them is highly unusual for socialist realist art. There is this domestic, luxurious um, uh, atmosphere. Uh, this is the private residence of, of Lenin and Nadezhda Krupskaya. Um, and of course, uh, the, the justification for creating this work um, during 1960s to humanize uh, the great figure of Lenin. But there's so many details and so many subtle, meaningful statements because, um, um, so this is the information that you can find on the label that provides <clears throat> basic data you need to, to, to understand what the painting is all about. But here is a contrast. So this is another work from the Manichug uh, uh, Brady collection. This one is a typical subject matter rendered in a typical manner uh, for the Soviet realist period, dates to the same year as the previous one. This painting 
if I'm not mistaken, Ross, please collect it, correct me if I'm wrong. I think that this painting is now in the collection of the Museum of Russian Art in Minneapolis, Minnesota. That's correct. Thank you. So, but it is a wonderful painting showing in a typical way, Lenin giving a speech. Um, it might seem um, a very obvious statement, but this, there are several layers of substantial political messages in, in communist ideology, in, in, um, Lenin's, uh, um, um, in Lenin's writings, a, a very important point was made that the revolution was possible because of, of the union between workers, peasants and soldiers. That's what made possible the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. And the public here is rendered to show the three groups supporting the ideas and partaking in overturning the old regime. The colors, the atmosphere, everything is as one would expect. And look at how different uh, is the rendition of Lenin. It's, like, it's almost like a uh, um, half-land bourgeois couple enjoying tea in an impressionist painting. Um, Traditional socialist realism rendered Lenin in this particular way. This is a painting from the 1930s. It's a classic work of socialist realism, almost photographic realism. Um, and um, I wanted you to see this to appreciate how unusual uh, the, the painting from the Manichuk Brady collection is, the one that, that is now um, on display at the Georgia Museum of Art. So here it is. I showed, uh, it was very intriguing for me um, to find anything specific about the location. And um, do you see this uh, exquisite neoclassical chair? I was able to find one that is very close. If not, it belongs to the same set. And thus it was possible to identify uh, where this luxurious interior is. It's uh, a former neoclassical estate near uh, Moscow. You can see more examples of these chairs. Um, this is the place where um, Lenin resides for several years of his life. The painting is set probably in this particular addition to the main neoclassical mansion. Additional views. Why is what, what was the significance of selecting this particular environment for portraying the leader of the, of the world proletariat may, is what makes this painting so intriguing. The second painting shows a group of uh, 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 an elderly lady and her husband involved in a very simple quotidian pursuit of hanging the newly made, the newly washed um, uh, clothes that they are carrying um, in a washing basin. Uh, the, the, older, the elderly lady is very decisive. She's a typical uh, socialist year, uh, Soviet year of Babushka. Her husband follows her lead. He carries a stool and around his neck as a very large necklace, there is a string of, of laundry clips, they're paper clips. I have, I have a picture. This is how they're used in case you don't know. Um, but the painting is all about the um, difficulty of life during communism um, and how uh, elderly people struggling through life um, are preserving their dignity and their humanity. Um, another painting, a major work, a large canvas, shows, um, a, a, shows a moment that, that allegedly took place um, in, at the end, just after the end of World War II. Um, Ivan Babenko's Waiting 1945 shows a young lady dressed in her, most, in her best white dress, waiting the arrival of her husband, her fiance, her beloved, who didn't come back from the war. So she has been here waiting uh, with, uh, uh, with a group of people who have already left um, and she's still alone clutching uh, uh, um, some um, uh, branches of blossoming lilac her white uh, handkerchief to wave uh, a welcome. Um, and she's alone in the devastated countryside, ravaged uh, by the war. The painting is full of meanings. It, was, it took 10 years to create it from 75 to 85. And it is about betrayed promises uh, 
um, we will talk more about this particular canvas uh, later on in, in the uh, meeting today when we will hear uh, from George and he, we will hear about his interpretation of this work. So uh, the painting is a typical, uh, the painting reflects sentiments that were very, very common during the, the, the period of World War II, uh, where a common theme, a topos of, of the literature, uh, the, uh, the poetry, uh, the painting, um, um, the, the films of the period involved the notion that the soldiers fighting on the front have a chance to survive if their beloved wait for them faithfully. So that is basically the starting point. Um, the next painting um, shows a landscape in an in a, in a old 18th century uh, city um, in South Ukraine, uh, the city of Kherson. Um, many visitors to, to the Georgia Museum of Art were surprised by the impressionist style, by the pa painterly qualities of this work. And, and this is one of the favorite paintings uh, for, the, for our audiences uh, so far. What makes this painting um, so intriguing is of course uh, the, 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 the masterful painterly rendition of the seascape, of, of the cityscape, but there are so many additional layers of meaning. Um, and I want you to, to just hear about them briefly. So you have a sense of uh, what makes this work so intriguing. The city of Kherson is a historic city. It was built in the 18th century by Catherine the Great and Prince Potemkin to enable the establishment of the Russian Empire's Black Sea Fleet. The view that you see uh, in this painting is from high above. Um, and you can see in photographs, contemporary photographs, the area of the large port seem um, in a similar way. On the surface, the painting is about blossoming socialist economy and seen through the activities in the port. But the city is a historic city and the point of view of the artist is from the uh, 18th century area on the top of the hill. So, history is inserted into the, the, the process of appreciating the view of the bustling socialist board. Another example uh, of, um, of layering statements in an individual work of art is this landscape by Mikola uh, Kravtsov. So it's a autumnal landscape in Southern Ukraine. But what is so important is that in addition to uh, the trees uh, uh, changing colors in the background, we have um, signs of, of advanced industry in this region. So this, this mounds that you see in the background uh, speak to the fact that this region uh, of Ukraine was well known um, for its uh, coal mining. And so the hills are actually um, spoil tips. These are, uh, these are piles of waste stroke and soil um, removed during the process of mining uh, coal. So is this about the landscape and the beauty of the fall trees? Is this about the way industry and nature connect? Is this about the way in which um, industry spoils nature? There are many different facets, but on the surface, it's about celebrating socialist, socialist, uh, the socialist economy and the successes of, of the coal mining industry. So here are some uh, photographs to show you that at present, you can still see these mounds, these spoil heaps. So, so these are works created during the communist period, but they in many ways are not typical examples of socialist political propaganda. And this is what makes the selection so intriguing. Um, and and um, it is indeed so exciting to look for meanings in these works. So um, before, before we continue, if we have enough time, at the end of our meeting today, we will talk in general about uh, socialist realism. But now I would like to return uh, to, um, let's return um, to one of the paintings. Let's go to uh, perhaps Lenin. 
and have it on the screen while uh, we um, ask some questions. Um, I would like to ask Rose to tell us something about um, her own experience of living in and working in Moscow. Okay, <clears throat> well, first of all, I'd like to thank you, uh, Asan and Kellen, uh, for inviting me to this, to this wonderful uh, conversation. And thank you so much, Asan, for that wonderful uh, description of the paintings. I, I really learned a lot and I, I appreciate it. Um, I lived in Moscow from 89 to 93 when I was working as a uh, bureau chief for Business Week magazine. And uh, that was a very exciting time uh, because it was when the Cold War ended and uh, the Soviet Union collapsed and it was the beginning of independence for all the uh, former Soviet states, including Russia and Ukraine as, as we're going to discuss. So that was a, an exciting time for me. Um, I was not very interested in the art world myself. I was more into political and economic journalism at that time. Um, but I would say that that experience changed my life because of the Soviet connection. Uh, many years later, um, in 2000, I was uh, introduced by a mutual friend who had a Soviet connection uh, to Yuri. And that's how I ended up getting married and uh, being involved in this art collection. So my job in the Soviet Union from 89 to 93 was probably the highlight of my journalism career, but altogether I worked about 30 years as either a, a reporter or ed editor mostly for Business Week magazine, but for a few other publications as well. Very impressive. Um, Rose, when you met Mr. Manichuk, he had already formed the collection of nearly right. 140 paintings. So where was the collection at that time? And what can you tell us about the journey of the collection from Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, to the United States? Right. Um, well, we're going to meet George Nesterchuk later, um, but when, when I uh, met Yuri, which was in March 2000, the collection was uh, in George's home in, in uh, the Washington DC area. area. When, when Yuri uh, collected the paintings in the 90s, uh, he um, first arranged for them to be shipped to Rome because there was supposed to be an exhibit there uh, in 98 but that exhibit didn't take place. Uh, the businessman who was sponsoring it ran out of money. And so that exhibit was canceled. But then the paintings went, uh, were sent by the businessman to Canada uh, to the home of a former uh, Canadian ambassador to Ukraine who had been a friend of Yuri's. Um, and they stayed there for a year. And this was a lot of paintings. Mm -hmm. uh, it was 135 paintings at that time. And then after when those diplomats were posted to another post, that was when uh, Yuri contacted his friend George uh, to ask if George could uh, store the paintings for a little while. So the paintings went from uh, Canada over land to the Washington DC area and George and Yuri and uh, probably George's son unloaded the paintings and stored many of them in George's basement and some in the garage because they were too big to go into the basement. And uh, they stayed there a long time as, as was mentioned in George's introduction. Um, when Yuri and I met, the first thing we did was, uh, well, after we got married in August, 2000, the first thing we did was go down to Washington and Cubs, pull together as many paintings as would fit into a van. And what's so interesting, Asen, is that uh, of the six paintings that you have chosen four of them used to be in our apartment. We ended up uh, fitting about 12 paintings into the van on that trip and altogether by the time uh, Yuri passed away in 2009, we had 18 paintings in our apartment. But it was a long journey and uh, the rest of the paintings uh, stayed and slowly were taken from George's house when they were exhibited in the 2000s Oh, sorry, after Yuri's death in 2009. But uh, the last 50 were taken out uh, in 2019 when I was preparing to donate the paintings. Since you mentioned the donation, um, would you please tell us where are the paintings of the Manichu Brady collection at present? Right. Um, right now, there's, uh, you have six paintings in your museum and I'm very grateful that, that you accepted that donation. Uh, I gave 11 paintings to Amherst College's 
Mead Art Museum, and I gave 111 paintings to the Museum of Russian Art in Minneapolis. And you mentioned Edward Kasanek uh, at the beginning. I'm uh, very grateful to Edward, the uh, former the curator emeritus of the New York Public Library Slavic uh, collection, because he was the person who put me in touch with you as well as the other two curators and who advised me on all of these donations. Well, we, we all are very grateful to Edward and to you uh, for making possible this gift. But because of Edwards or uh, Edwards' uh, strong encouragement, you started doing work on, on the on Mr. Manichuk's archive. That's Would right. Think to tell us something about this work that you've done in the last two or three years. Yeah, even even less than that. Um, basically, um, in the course of giving away uh, the paintings, which I was working on in 2019 and and 2020. Um, I went through all of Yuri's documents, which he had saved from collecting the art um, and which I had looked at uh, when I moved from, from Brooklyn to, to Naples, Florida in 2010, but I hadn't studied them carefully. And there's a lot of documents. So uh, Edward suggested to me um, that I try to write or that I write a history of the collection, which is what I'm working on right now, which is basically going to be in three sections. One is about how Yuri assembled the collection and got it to the US, which I've described to you. The second part is how we tried to find a home for the collection in the 2000s during our marriage. And then the last part, which I'm writing right now, is what I did after 2009 to try to find a home for the collection. And that took me 10 years. Um, some along the way, uh, I was lucky enough to donate long-term to the Ukrainian Institute of America, uh, up to 63 paintings, and they had two major exhibits. And one painting was on loan to the Brooklyn Museum uh, for five years. But uh, uh, it, it wasn't until I met Edward that the idea of donating the paintings came about. And that happened in 2019 and 2020, as I described, and I'm very happy that that all worked out. That's wonderful. Um, so, Mr. Manichuk started, did he start collecting in Ukraine uh, after going there in the early 1990s, or did he collect before then? Do you know? Yeah, um, I know that in his earlier years, uh, before he moved to the U.S. the first time, he, he first came to the U.S. in the 1980s with his first wife. And before he did that, he collected some 18th and 19th century paintings, but he left them in Ukraine at that time. So his real collecting activities uh, happened in, in the 90s when he went back to Ukraine uh, as a legal advisor to the Ukrainian government on behalf of the, the US government and the World Bank. Yuri was trained as a lawyer and had been a law professor, but when he went back, uh, he became a legal advisor to the government. And that was when he began to collect the art. And he did that because he had a sense, first of all, it was being thrown away, as you mentioned, Asan, in your introduction. It was very discredited, and the paintings were either being put in it because they were communists, they were considered communists, and it was newly independent Ukraine. They were put in deep storage or painted over and the like. And Yuri, one, wanted to save the paintings, and two, they gave him a sense of nostalgia for his Soviet past, and so he wanted to preserve them as a kind of window on the past. And then he thought, as you said in your uh, introduction, that they would be of historic and artistic significance and would be appreciated eventually. So he wanted them to be studied and appreciated by future generations. Well, we hope we will be able to contribute to this um, in the future. Um, after working uh, on the documents, do you have a sense who were the sellers? Who were the, the, the people or the, the individuals or the institutions who sold works of art to Mr. Manichuk? Almost exclusively, uh, Yuri purchased the paintings from either the artists or their heirs, um, and uh, uh, directly. Um, a lot of the art, if the artists were not alive, sometimes he purchased them from the wives of the artists, from the children, but it was almost always from, from the artists. And, and he did it in a very systematic way. He got uh, help from art specialists in Kiev and other cities. And he went on a series of expeditions around 
the country with art specialists to visit artist studios and to talk to artists and to pick out uh, these paintings, which were all painted from the 50s to the 80s, um, but it was a wide uh, variety of sort of uh, types of paintings, you know, some still life, some portraits, some scenes uh, of work in life, some historic scenes, um, but, but that was how he, he collected it and it was almost always from the artists. Um, thank you. And um, you've started talking a little bit about the paintings that you and Mr. Manichuk uh, lovingly displayed in your home. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us a little bit about the paintings that were you, yours and his favorite ones? We are very fortunate to have some of them. Yeah, well, well, my, my personal favorite is uh, Waiting 1945, um, just because I, I uh, found it a very poignant and beautiful painting. We had that in our dining room. So, so every time I would sit down to eat with Yuri or with our guests, I would see that painting on the opposite wall. And so that's, that's, that's one of my personal favorites. Um, and elders, the, the, the elderly couple also was in our home. And uh, that's another one of my favorites. But I have a very sort of um, just personal visceral reaction to these paintings, not because of any art historical knowledge, just I, I just like them. There's one that um, you don't have because it was too big and it, it, was, uh, it came on a roll when uh, Yuri brought it to the US and it's a gigantic painting of uh, the Soviet co cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin uh, being greeted by Khrushchev and Brezhnev. And that painting also, although it's very, um, uh, you, could, you could say it's a political painting in some, to some extent, but it's, it's a very joyous moment. And, and it's got beautiful pictures of all these Soviet citizens clapping and cheering for this cosmonaut as he walks down a red carpet. That was in our living room and it was nine feet high by 14 feet long. So that was one of my favorites too, but it was also a major conversation piece <laughs> when we had guests. And is it now Yuri Gagarin in, in Minneapolis, Minnesota? Yes, yes, that, that's at, at the Museum of Russian Art in Minneapolis. Wonderful. Um, maybe we, could, we can go now, um, we can return to waiting 1945 mm -hmm. and invite um, George to join us um, and give us his point of view on this painting. Yes, George has a very interesting point of view. George, thank you for willing to contribute to today's conversation. We cannot see you and it seems that your mic is muted for the moment. Okay, I'm on. Thank you, thank you for joining us. Yes, yeah, a pleasure to be here. <clears throat> I enjoyed your presentation, very informative. Uh, a good research on, on some of the, uh, the background associated with some of those paintings, uh, very informative, thank you. So what you, tell us what you think about this large canvas. Well, I was uh, struck by this painting uh, from the first time I saw it. Uh, it uh, in the uh, collection, uh, the book that uh, uh, Yuri assembled uh, uh, of, of his collection, this was one of the first paintings in there. I think it's number, number five. So as I was uh, going through the book, uh, it just struck me uh, just from the vividness, the color, uh, and uh, the, the pathos in there. It was not representative to me of socialist realism uh, that tended to glorify the workers and peasants, uh, uh, soldiers, the state. Uh, this was a very uh, human painting. Uh, it spoke more to the human condition than a uh, political message. So, uh, and, and the colors are very vivid, uh, uh, very lifelike in here. So th that caught my attention. And then I, I noted the, the title, Waiting Period 1945, which was kind of unusual for me, stressing 1945. It's a contemporary painting, uh, 1975. Uh, so uh, clearly the, uh, the author, the painter was conveying a message in that. Uh, and so when you look at, at some of the detail, then I, I was also struck by the, the contrast in the, the, the desolate uh, uh, 
uh, uh, environment that she finds herself in, uh, the light shining on her. So she's clearly the center of attention, uh, but she's surrounded by desolation. So, okay, 1945, end of the war, uh, desolation. And now we have the messaging there of, of uh, victory. The train that's leaving the station in there has a, a sign on there, Pubiada, uh, meaning victory. So they're clearly celebrating the end of the war and she's waiting for someone to come back. Uh, but now I look at, at the timeline of, of the painting, 1975. So this was probably prepared for some exhibition uh, in 1975. And there's a second date, 1985, 10 years later. So I look at this and I said, this couldn't have taken 10 years to complete. So uh, clearly something happened in the interim and the painter, the artist decided to reissue this in 1985. Now, I don't know if it was ever exhibited in 1975, the original date, but the, the, the contrast in the dates is, is significant politically. 1975 was the Brezhnev era, a fairly repressive time. Uh, it was also a time where there was a lot of political activism. The uh, uh, human rights movement uh, had uh, taken root. The Helsinki Accord of 1975 uh, led to the creation of a lot of opposition movements uh, in the Soviet Union. Uh, in most of the... Uh, uh, states in the, in the Soviet Union. Uh, so there was political unrest in 1975 and it was uh, basically pushing back on the repressions of the Brezhnev era. 1985 is the uh, Glasnost period. That's when Gorbachev came on the scene and uh, started his Glasnost perestroika movement. Uh, and that allowed people to speak out. They felt emboldened to speak out. So I, I read in that, the 1985 reissuance, that this artist chose that time for a political message. And the messaging here, uh, waiting uh, from a political standpoint is, okay, this is Ukraine. Uh, the symbol for me, the young lady represents Ukraine, uh, his native land, and she's waiting. And in 1985, she's still waiting. Uh, we saw the desolation of 1945 with a lot of promises of a better life, a better future, but that never materialized. Certainly the people that, that were speaking out in the, the human rights movement, the writers, cinematographers, artists were basically looking for more freedom of expression. And I think uh, the artist Babenko took advantage of 1985 in Glasnost to put out this message that we are still waiting from 1945 to 1985, we are still waiting. I appreciated the, uh, the song that you, uh, you presented in, in your discussion of this. Uh, it, it gives him the freedom to use the title uh, waiting uh, uh, in a, using a popular song as a justification for this message. It's a very human message of pathos, uh, of uh, unrequited love, if you will, someone still waiting. But symbolically, it's also a political message that we are still waiting for the promises of 1945 that haven't materialized to this day. Thank you, George. That is wonderful. Thank you so much for your interpretation of this painting. I completely agree with everything you say, and I'm I'm particularly grateful to, to you for, for, for because you helped us understand how uh, art that was created the communist era succeeded in being simultaneously in complying with with the requirements of the government and and conveying subversive messages. Yeah, that was one of the tremendous challenges for the artists in that period. And that's something Yuri was very sensitive to. Uh, one of the things he said, he, he wanted to, to collect art to preserve the artistic aspects of that period because uh, much of the artwork was being misinterpreted as uh, promulgating 
uh, state policy, supporting state policy. But there are subtleties in there as well, where the artists were seeking to ex express their points of view. And there are many paintings where that symbolism is built into the paint, and it takes a second level of reading between the lines to understand that. So uh, Yuri was very sensitive to that, and uh, that was one of the reasons he wanted to salvage uh, the, these pieces of art. This is yes. wonderful. Thank you so much. That was so. That was very enlightening, and this kind of uh, uh, reading that that addresses different superimposed layers. Of, of, of meaning in the works on display applies to all six of them. So, um, I, uh, Callan, in this moment, I would like to ask for your help because I cannot see the chat uh, messages and the Q&A uh, um, section of the screen because I'm sharing my screen. Would you be willing to read the, the questions? Absolutely, so we have, um... Two questions so far, and I, I, I would invite anybody else in the audience, if you have questions for any of our speakers today, you can add those to the Q&A box now. Um, but there are a couple already here from um, uh, William Island, the director of the Georgia Museum of Art. Um, and let's see, this first one, um, he says, Mrs. Brady, as you note, we chose from your collections works that can be and have been called non-conformist in the face of, of Soviet realism. Could you talk for a minute about that aspect of what we are exhibiting, especially when you said that four of the ones we have were displayed in your home? Right. Well, first of all, I want to thank Dr. Island as well for, uh, for accepting the donation. Um, well, George just actually gave a pretty good description of the nonconformists of, of the waiting 1945 uh, painting. Um, the other ones, uh, I don't think that uh, when we chose those paintings, we were thinking of, of, I don't mean when Yuri collected them, I mean when we chose them for our apartment, we thought of them as, as a nonconformist way. I will tell you that we did have um, one painting in our apartment. This is the one that was uh, on on display for five years uh, at the Brooklyn Museum that uh, the artist uh, painted. It was a graduate student who was, uh, he had his head on a, on a table um, in his kitchen. And the, there were two babies in the foreground of this painting. And that when the artist painted it, uh, she painted it with no rug. And the, uh, the, when the artist did these paintings, they had to be approved by a, a committee of the Ministry of Culture if they were going to be accepted for exhibition. And when she showed this to the committee of the Ministry of Culture, the committee, according to my husband said, Soviet graduate students can afford a rug. So she had to uh, paint a rug in and paint a, a uh, tablecloth in, which reminds me a little bit of the Lenin painting with the, the beautiful tablecloth and everything. Um, so uh, actually when she originally painted the painting, it only had one baby. And when she painted the rug, it fell out of balance. So she had to add two paintings. So that's just as another way of describing the, the difficulties that the artists had in trying to conform. And yet they still created these beautiful, these beautiful paintings, which sometimes had elements of Ukrainian folk culture in them and other little Ukrainian signs that, that they managed to get through, even though, as, Asen, you can correct me on this, but my understanding was just from Yuri's documents and reading a little bit about this, that the Ukrainian Ministry of Culture was quite conservative in terms of adhering to socialist realist uh, uh, strictures through much of their time, but the artists still found ways to get, get their message across in little ways. You're absolutely right. I believe uh, the, mini the Soviet Ministry of Culture itself, the central Ministry of Culture um, in Moscow was, was extremely conservative, uh, but it's exactly uh, uh, this. This is exactly why the paintings that that we have now on display are so interesting because these paintings were not uh, forbidden; they somehow um, uh, succeeded to 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 live to the expectations of the Soviet government, and yet they convey so many layers of meaning. Most of them subversive. Yeah, um, I think you're especially like the paintings from the 60s, which I think was, you know, during the Khrushchev, Khrushchev thaw when uh, I think the, they were allowed to create uh, 
more realistic, uh, even though they're all realism, but harsher views sometimes of, of, of the standard of living, like you can see right in the, uh, the one of elders. It's not, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful painting, but it, you, you might say it's not that happy a scene, but it's, it's um, tough conditions. And the painting that we, can, we have not displayed uh, uh, because we're still conserving it is an embodiment of this new period in the history of, of Soviet culture. Oh. It started with the ascent of, of Nikita Khrushchev um, and, and with the so-called um, um, spring of the Khrushchev period. So this is a contemplation of artistic creativity by a lady who is so accomplished that she can create this wonderful realistic portrait of herself, but she's thinking about the history of art, about avant-garde art in particular, about uh, women's creativity. All this is packed into this exquisite, large pastel portrait. What was the other question, Callan? Um, the other one also from, from Bill, Dr. Island, was um, related to waiting 1945, and he's asking, are the flowers near the sign left by other waiting war uh, uh, widows or lovers? So I guess the flowers, the, are the flowers near the sign left by other waiting war widows or lovers? Um, if I may, I will attempt to answer this question, but all uh, uh, input and contributions from Rose and, and George are, are more than welcome. Um, so the whole train was decorated and it traveled um, to its final destination, decorated with banners, such as these red banners, as George said, the banner says, victory. Um, and, and the flowers are the flowers that symbolize spring um, and, and the joys of spring, but also sensual love and sensual fulfillment. These are lilacs. And so the lady is also carrying some of them. You can see some, some branches of blossoming lilac um, um, on the floor of the platform. So uh, we don't know exactly who, who, who put them, but it's all in celebration of victory and springtime and, and the hope of, 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 of fulfillment, a uh, human fulfillment. Um, there is something I want to point out. Um, the, fl the flowers, of course, lilacs blossom all around Eastern Europe. But lilacs have something very specifically Ukrainian about them, as far as I can say, George can correct me. There's a, one of the most famous lilac forests, a lilac, a lilac grove, um, is found in Ukraine on the grounds of a world famous estate belonging to the Princess Kachube. This is the lilac grove of the, the, the estate Dikanka. And I found on the internet <laughs> some, some very useful photographs. So there might be something, uh, there are general connotations uh, of, of, of love and sensual fulfillment of spring, but also there might be some specific references to what lilacs mean to Ukrainians. There also are several paintings of uh, Ukraine of lilacs in the collection, not, not just this, there's, yeah. there's several, several still lifes. Um, Callan, are there other questions? Yes, we have two more questions and comments. Um, the first is from Jean Petrovs, who's one of our docents here at the museum. And she's asking, were any of these artists widely known by the public or by art experts? Uh, yes, <laughs> because um, this, is, this I know this, I'm sure Asan can answer this is better, but uh, the, these are, when, when Yuri started collecting uh, the paintings, and I know this from his documents, he went to some artists and say, give me please a list of the artists that I should look for and, and meet in order, to, uh, in order to begin to assemble this collection. And, and so they were well, well known to art specialists. And also they were highly uh, educated. The, uh, the art education in, in in the Soviet time was, was very uh, sophisticated and, and very much in a classical uh, tradition and heavily subsidized by the government. So uh, they were highly educated artists. Can, can I well, add a, a comment to that? Uh, Yuri went about uh, collecting these artworks very thematically. These, these weren't random uh, selections. 
uh, he worked with uh, people at the National Museum of Art in Kiev, uh, going through lists of uh, socialist realism art that had been created in the previous decades, uh, just to assess uh, how many might still be out there. Uh, a lot of the paintings were officially collected by museums and institutions around Ukraine. So they served as uh, repositories and they were the owners of uh, a lot of the art that had been created during the Soviet period. But a number of, of, of uh, works that had been recorded as having been exhibited uh, in various uh, exhibits over the decades uh, were not on the registers of these institutions. So those are the ones that he went after. And anyone that had their uh, works exhibited uh, officially uh, was a uh, relatively well-known artist. Uh, they didn't choose unknowns for their public uh, uh, displays. So. Uh, yeah, to answer the question, they were fairly well known, uh, some more famous than others, uh, but the, they, uh, their works were registered in, in various institutions in Ukraine, and that's what uh, Yuri went after. He, he, and, estimated, and that, he estimated that about one third of the works that had been created going back to the 50s until uh, the 90s uh, were still out in private hands. And, and those are the, uh, the, the works he tried to collect. And, and that also explains, if I may add to what George said, uh, why Yuri got most of the paintings from the artists or their heirs. He actually went to their studios and their uh, art workshops and, and, and uh, that's, that's how he got them. Thank you so much, Callan. What are the next? What is the next question? We we have two. Um, a couple more comments have popped in. One might be um, answered quickly. Uh, Mamata is asking, again related to waiting, nineteen forty-five. Asking about the shadow on the lower left of the platform, mm -hmm. um, and wondering if it's a horse. Oh, the shadow um, over here. If you can see my um, my cursor. Yes. This is, this is a, a soldier's bag. It's made of a particular very sturdy green colored fabric. And it contains the most essential items that belong to every soldier. I, was, I served in the communist army for two years and I had one of those <laughs> much later. And as you can see, uh, you would have a, a, a spoon, uh, you would have a small container, a small, uh, a small aluminum cup, um, and then very few uh, personal items. The significance of this detail is that a soldier who just returned home and was met by members of his family or, or by his beloveds forgot about his bag and just left it at the, at the station. Yeah. Great, thank you. That's so interesting. Um, and then we have a, a comment from uh, uh, Janice Simon, who is a professor of art history at the art school here at UGA. Um, and she says, it's more of a comment than a question, I think. I am so struck at the display of wealth and prosperity and Western uh, decadence that the Lenin at home painting displays, <laughs> and then the actual place that you found a sen. Uh, wasn't there any um, hypocrisy seen in this since the proletariat hardly could live this way? That's a wonderful question. Thank you, Janice. Uh, yes, there is a great deal of hypocrisy, uh, but um, uh, it's amazing that the artist succeeded in creating a painting, creating a painting that was not destroyed, because this the, this hypocrisy was not acknowledged as a problem for the communist government. On the surface, the function of this painting is to humanize. Uh, this larger than life historic figure, the leader of the world proletariat, who is constantly fighting uh, for the interests of the working peoples. But look, he's enjoying a very old bourgeoisie style um, home entertainment. Yes, so there are several layers to this. The first one is that if you are an accomplished painter, who has a predilection for create, uh, for uh, painting interiors, you have to find an excuse to paint a neoclassical interior. I, I, when I saw this painting, the thing that struck me most was that 
there is a painting of Lenin with pink, I mean, pink in color, silk brocade curtains, which is the epitome of bourgeois taste and high style, and also pink silk upholstery for the seat of a neoclassical chair, silver uh, uh, utensils and dishes and luxurious porcelain. All of this was supposed to humanize him, to, to show that Lenin is one, a human being that can enjoy simple pleasures. But the other layer of it is that this is a historic estate, and that, that's why it is so important to acknowledge that this is a specific historic building, which was, um, uh, which still exists. It is a museum now. Um, it was well preserved, uh, regardless of the fact that thousands upon thousands of similar estates and exquisite houses were destroyed during and in the wake of the revolution. This was preserved, this particular estate, Gorky, was preserved because it became Lenin's Moscow residence. Lenin spoke about the need to preserve the past and used the example of this particular neoclassical estate um, as, as an illustration of, of the attempt to preserve the history of Russia. So there is this uh, element to it. And of course, there is a subversive message. The subversive message is, look how they live and look at us. Our leaders live this way, they always did. Um, and, and that's accepted. So there is this possibility to read the, uh, the painting in a subversive manner. Uh, Asin, could you go back to that painting? Could you put it back up? Yes. Yeah, on the on the point of, of uh, decadence there, I note the chair that he's sitting on compared to the chair that she is sitting on and the and the other one on the side. That's more of a chair that you'd find out on the porch. And I'm wondering if perhaps he wasn't seated in a nicer looking chair and someone decided that perhaps that looked too decadent uh, for Lenin and perhaps asked him to fix it as they did in the case of the uh, uh, of the student uh, dad uh, that uh, Rose had spoken of, where they asked him to put in a, a rug and, and a tablecloth on the, on the table. And so I'm wondering if perhaps there wasn't a touch up done to this thing afterwards. That's quite possible. If we have an x-ray, we will be able to establish yeah. whether <laughs> there is a layer underneath. This kind of wicker chair, they're, they're still surviving similar chairs in the museum that the, the, the estate is preserving mm -hmm. everything associated with the life of Lenin there. Very interesting. Are there other questions? Yes, there's one more. Um, Dr. Island also commented on, on Dr. Simon's comment that it's, um, um, it's an haute bu a, a bourgeois painting of, of Lenin there. Um, and then we have our final question from Lacey Camp, who is one of our, our docents as well at the museum. And she asks, what are the two other paintings that we are lucky to have that are the ones you had in your home, Rose? Uh, the one that I had uh, in, in my home, in addition to waiting in elders, was the port picture of Herson that was in our home. And the fourth was, uh, let's see, what was the fourth? It was, um, and it, well, oh, the, the portrait, waiting, the port, and, it, and elders. So those, those four. And this painting, I do have a small story about that one, but it, 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 it doesn't pertain directly to Yuri, but that was exhibited at the Ukrainian Institute of America in 2012. The Institute uh, had, uh, as I mentioned, 63 paintings for almost eight years. This was the inaugural exhibit. And uh, a friend of mine, a Russian friend of mine in, uh, in, in New York brought uh, her son to this uh, exhibit. And he looked at this painting and he began to, he tears started to come in his eyes. And it's because he used to visit the port of Herson with his grandfather. And he remembered that, that image. So it was, uh, it, was, it was very interesting to have this personal interaction through one of the visitors to the Ukrainian Institute of America in New York's exhibit. 
Um, but we just, we, we picked it out because we liked it and, uh, and it fit into the van. <laughs> so. mm -hmm. Wonderful. Callan, um, we are um, out of time. It is one o'clock, it's 2.01. Um, so um, are there any questions that we, we should address? Those are all of the questions from the audience. Um, and I know we are at the one hour mark, um, but if you, it's up to you if you'd like to go through quickly your discussion of social realist painting, if you think we have time for those who- Well, we can allow that. people who have to go to leave and those who are willing to stay for five or 10 minutes more, um, we, can, um, we can ask to be patient with us. And then um, I can talk to you briefly about socialist realism in general, just so, uh, so we, we have the, the wider horizons. Uh, okay. in mind when we uh, think about this wonderful six painting. So what is socialist uh, realism? Well, the most important thing to, to start with uh, is to draw a clear distinction between social realism in 19th century art and literature and, and uh, socialist realism, which is a phenomenon of Soviet culture. So for many of you, uh, social realism um, in, in 19th century art is familiar uh, through the works of art of Courbet in France, uh, through the writings of such distinguished uh, French um, writers uh, as Emile Zola. Um, but um, uh, this tradition is of great importance in, in the Russian empire as well. There, is, there was a great realist movement in the second half of the 19th century, both in the realm of the visual arts and, and in literature as well. So uh, it is precisely this tradition of, of social realism, art, that addresses issues of social inequality and injustice that fuels the ideas that, that crystallized in the theory of socialist realism. So uh, communist uh, theoreticians um, made a special effort to distinguish socialist realism from social realism by introducing a specific term, critical realism, which in the Soviet era, all around the Eastern Bloc, was the appropriate term to use when speaking about social realism in 19th century art in general. The statement, the implicit statement of using this, this term critical realism was to emphasize that 19th century art did this critique of, of the social reality without applying the lessons of communist political ideology. So they critiqued, but they did not have, didn't have of, did not offer solutions to the social problems. Socialist realism fully uh, uh, versed in the ideas of Marx uh, and Lenin and the socialist revolution could not only identify the problems, but would point out to the best possible solutions. Um, for the first time, the term socialist realism was used in 1932. This is 10 years after Stalin um, came to power. He came to power virtually in 1922. Lenin was still alive, but he was in very bad shape. So Lenin died in 1924 and Stalin did, Stalin's dictatorship started then. So you can see this is several years into the political regime of Stalin. Um, the idea of the official introduction of socialist realism as the appropriate way uh, to, for a creative person um, to reflect on the reality uh, that surrounds them was introduced in 1933 um, during, um, during um, no, 1934 in the Congress of the Soviet Writers. So this was an organization controlled by the Communist Party, a very distinguished uh, um, representative of, of social realism from before the Bolshevik era, Maxim Gorky, a world famous artist, delivered uh, uh, an important speech. Previously, he published an article titled Socialist Realism. And so here are the main four points 
that define what is socialist realism. The content of the work should be proletarian. The art should be relevant to the workers and understandable to them. It should be, second, it should be it should represent what's typical in the society, scenes of everyday life and of the people, not eccentric people, not rarities. Um, um, three, it has to be realistic, uh, realistic in the representational sense. It, sh it should be illusionistic art, and it has to be partisan. It has partisan is not a good word uh, in English to translate the specific term used in in, in Russian. Uh, during the Soviet era, it means uh, partisanist. It's to represent faithfully the ideas of the Bolshevik party. So these are the requirements. So what are deliberately the theoreticians of socialist realism put a great emphasis on the fact that uh, socialist realism continued the best tradition of 19th century Russian art. And one classic example for this is the famous large canvas of Ilya Efimovich Repin, uh, barge haulers on the Volga. So this is a work that celebrates uh, uh, the dehumanized existence of these laborers who are used like, like beasts of burden. They pull barges um, against the flow of the current of the Volga River. Another example by the same um, artist, the great uh, Ilya Arietin, is this painting, a religious procession in the Kursk province. The religious procession involves a miraculous icon carried in a special movable altar, but it is this is a view of the entire Russian empire, of the different classes, of the different inequities, and it all happens against this, this hill that has been the forest covered Covering it had just been cut. So it's devastation, desolation, but there is this extravagance of the religious procession. So it is this tradition that was very, very forcefully embraced by the artists of, um, of the socialist realist movement. What is so striking, what is so unexpected for people who know um, what happened in the art uh, circles uh, in Russia, around the time of the Bolshevik revolution is that in the early years of the revolution, the art that was, that was created to support the revolution and um, that was created by people who so unconditionally uh, uh, were on the side of, of the Bolshevik uh, um, revolution was avant-garde art. So this is a famous example of L. Lisitsky's poster, Bid the Whites with the Red Wedge. This is a, a summation of the um, civil war that followed the October Revolution. L. Lisitsky created this work while working in Vitebsk, one of the most Western, in terms of geographic location, one of the most Western cities of the Russian Empire. Um, where he worked, Lisitsky worked in the same, uh, at the same uh, art school, um, uh, when he created this poster together with Malevich um, and Mark Chagall. So this is the art that, that was accepted to support the revolution. The art that supported working people and Russian peasants in the years in preceding the revolution is exemplified by Natalia Goncharova. And so this is the art of the liberal establishments and the liberal establishments supported the revolution. But after the revolution, 10 years um, um, after Stalin came to power, this form of avant-garde art and formalistic experimentation was considered completely undesirable. And there are many, this is the art that was viewed as appropriate. Look at this, the date of this work is um, 1930. I didn't put it, sorry. It's, it's 1930. Uh, this is a painting that celebrates the Red Army and the victory of the Red Army in the civil war um, that followed the Bolshevik revolution. You can see it's a very painterly work, but the painterliness is redeemed by the politically correct subject matter. So what is usually lost from the discussion of socialist realism is why this switch to figuration 
and to illusionism. Why did it, why was it necessary to make it uh, such a big political imperative? And the answer to this is contained um, uh, in the first of the general principles of socialist realism, because the art that is created in a socialist state should be relevant to the workers and be understandable by them. The art that was created by L. Vysitsky and by Natalia Goncharova was impenetrable in among the, 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 the large supporters of the revolution, among the workers, among the peasants. Peasants were offended to see themselves depicted like this. They didn't care that the painting looks like Picasso or, or like African masks or like uh, prehistoric stone idols known all around Russia. They, they, it was, this message was lost among, among large members, of, large sections of, of the general audience. So, illusionistic, realistic art appeared. Some of it is great art. So this is an iconic work from 1932. So it's even, this is two years before the official establishment of socialist realism. This is a work that embodies a woman's empowerment. This is a new woman, a socialist woman. Um, a girl in a t-shirt. First, ladies don't wear t-shirts in, in the 1930s. She is wearing a t-shirt. She is an athletic lady, a mid-school teacher, a historic person. She died in 1977. And so this is an example of how communist society creates different human beings. So this is a famous uh, uh, painter, Alexander Samovalov, one of his most uh, emblematic works. This is another work by the same artist, a huge canvas. I mean, 147 inches. Of course, of course there are many uh, parallels between this art and the art of Nazi Germany. Um, and that is a very important parallel, but we will not dwell on it right now. I just want you to see how figuration becomes and, and, and illusionism become dominant um, in uh, the art of socialist realism. Some of the paintings are very skillfully done. So Fyodor Shubin created this portrait of Stalin, um, which celebrates the accomplishment of uh, the Soviet economy after World War II. And it is an accomplished work. You can dislike it, uh, of course, because of, of the subject matter, but we cannot deny that this is a well-trained painter who succeeded in a simple portrait to um, convey multiple ideologically highly significant messages. So first of all, there is peace in the countryside. The countryside is no longer ravaged by war. It is because the Soviet Union won the war against Nazi Germany. But look what's happening in the background. Lar tractors are plowing a huge field. So the land belongs to the state. These are not different sections, small sections of agricultural land belonging to different people. It's all socialist, it's all state property. There is a power line and there is a factory in the back. The landscape repeats some of the imperatives established by Lenin about what, how can a communist state be successful? Lenin defined this shortly before, shortly after the, the Bolshevik revolution. He said, um, communism, this is Soviet form of government plus electrification. And so here is the example of the electrification. Collectivization of the land, making all the land state property is embodied by this large field and then industrialization. And this is the fact. So that's, this is how um, socialist realism functioned and fulfilled the political imperatives of the era. So, and it could be done in an artistically skillful way or in this horrendous, just, just disturbingly kitschy uh, rendition, but they both exist. And this is the flow of the communist uh, visual discourse that allowed major compromises 
uh, on the basis of the content of the work, major aesthetic and artistic compromises because of the content of the work. So this is, this is what people usually think about socialist realism. It is this unabashed kitsch, but socialist works of art uh, were created that need to be re-examined. And the Brady, the Manny Chuk Brady collection allows us to do this, allows us to do this exactly at the time when art history is rewritten in most of Europe to incorporate the work created during the communist era and to allow us to see in a new way um, uh, the art from this time and to acknowledge that art history has been somewhat unexcusably snobbish and prejudiced. So, but that's not news. So thank you so much. Um, thank, thank you, you and thank, thank, thank you to Rose and George for all joining us today. This has been a, a really wonderful um, uh, program. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you as well. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you, Asen, for that wonderful description. And Callan and George for participating. Thank you, Rose. Thank you, George. Thank you for all your contributions and for the wonderful gift. Callan, thank you for organizing and supervising the event. Sure. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks um, to those in the audience for joining as well. So thank, thank you, you and have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.